The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining. Mike, they often say don't go grocery shopping on an empty stomach because you're you're going to buy too much food. You should also not have uh, a food-focused podcast on an empty stomach because I'm famished now. <laughs> that was, of course, Adam Maxwell, uh, CEO of Voyage Foods that just joined us. Uh, it was a great chat. What did you think? Yeah, no, it was great uh, chatting with Adam and hearing about all the incredible things that they're doing at Voyage Foods and and where they're going. Although he he stopped short of obviously telling us anything there because I think you know as per his lawyer's advice, breaching uh, you know some of his IP <laughs> agreements on a podcast is probably not a good legal practice. But nevertheless, I think he teased it enough to know that they're going to be doing some exciting things. But yeah, for sure. Someone like you, who I know has worked through your lunch to get this interview done with us today, <laughs> to hear about uh, you know the the peanut free nut butter and the cocoa free uh, chocolate and the bean free coffee, you must just be. Uh, just I'm on dying. the I'm, a, I'm on, on the, the edge, edge, buddy. I'm on the edge, buddy. I think um, it's interesting because of course the, the 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 genesis of the the company is is bringing to life foods. Uh, that we all know and love without necessarily the, uh, the, the, the reliance on the supply chain necessarily to get those raw goods. So uh, I thought it was a fascinating discussion. It's a really cool company. Uh, you'll even hear at the end that I, I revealed a lot about my, uh, uh, my nerdy self, but we'll, we'll let uh, the interview speak for itself. Uh, we'll now go to Adam Maxwell, CEO of Voyage Foods, who's going to tell us uh, more about his journey and uh, the company. Okay, now we're back and we're joined by uh, Adam Maxwell, who is the CEO of, uh, at Voyage Foods. He fell in love with food at a young age, so much so that when it came to his bar mitzvah, he gladly received a kitchen aid. And that very kitchen aid plus his passion for food led him to start working as a pastry ap- apprentice at the uh, ripe old age of 14 years old in the James Beard award-winning restaurant Clio. Uh, Adam continued to work in fine dining throughout his adolescence and into adulthood. Uh, well into his time as a student at McGill University, uh, where he studied food chemistry. In a fortuitous uh, turn of events, Adam left university just before graduating for an incredible opportunity to work at Chu in Boston, where he met fellow Voyage Foods co-founder Kelsey Tenney. Uh, Adam now leads a very talented team of food scientists and CPG experts working to revolutionize the food industry and secure the future of our favorite foods. And he's now a guest on the Unlikely Innovators. Adam, thanks so much for joining us. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, so in your bio, you, you you fell in love with food at an early age. And we'd like to sort of start out with, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a more open-ended question about your path so far. Was it a straight line from you studying food science at McGill to where we are now? Or how did how did that work? I mean, obviously, we, we know you, you, were, you love food at an early age, but how, how was that journey? Yeah, so I'm gonna half answer the question and and add, add a little piece of color. So yeah, I, I all of childhood or I guess adolescence, high school, I was working in restaurants, but uh, both my parents were academics uh, uh, in the Boston area. And I spent, I kind of always thought I'd had to do something in the hard sciences. And I never, I never really understood that like a, a real career in food could look like what my current career looks like. Um, so I was actually doing a, a large amount of astrophysical research uh, in high school and entered McGill to study astrophysics. Uh, and I was probably two years into my time at McGill, had hated the astro stuff, realized I didn't want to spend my entire life uh, behind a desk and a computer because I have much too much ADD for that. And I was talking about, you know, reinvigorating my love of food and dropping out of McGill to you know, go back to restaurants. And there was a fellow student who I had no idea what department she was in, but she was in the food chemistry department at McGill. And she was like, why don't you just like combine this love of science with love of food? And McGill is a great food science department, food chem department, like you should just switch. Uh, And the second I kind of realized that that existed, I kind of wholeheartedly dove in. Um, But to actually answer the question that you asked, uh, I don't really think there was any sort of linearity or process into kind of getting from dropping out of McGill to here. I was in food consulting for a few years and on the R&D side, research development, new product development consultancy. And, you know, from there, an old mentor of mine happened to bring me out West to kind of 
get my feet wet into the food tech space, work in a company called Endless West, uh, made incredible molecular wine and spirits, think whiskey without, or wine without grapes, whiskey without aging. Uh, and then this kind of happened organically. So yeah, I never really had, uh, these are the next steps I should take if I want to start my own company or anything like that. Adam, that's such a perfect answer because, well, perfect answer selfishly, I should say, because yeah. the name of the podcast is The Unlikely Innovators. Yeah. And if you had gone uh, from a young age and said, I'm going to take uh, this program in McGill and become a food scientist, and that was the end of the story, then it wouldn't be so unlikely. But I, <laughs> I think the uh, the rest of it really uh, holds true to the metaphor that we use for each episode. Yeah. And Adam, I wanted to ask you because, you know, in the bio, we'd Steve mentioned how at the ripe old age of 14, you started working at a James Beard award-winning restaurant. When I was 14, I think the part-time job that I had, I was teaching, you know, kids how to swim at the pool that I was training at. I was not working in a restaurant. So what was it like, you know, stepping into that kind of world, especially a high caliber world uh, that obviously is award-winning? What was it like as a 14-year-old stepping into that world and, and, and working there? I think there... It, it, there's a huge mixture of feelings, I think. On one side of my like emotional and cognitive brain, you know, I'd never been surrounded by people who cared as much about what they were doing. It was like a uh, culture where people respected every piece of the process, whether it was how you tie your aprons. In the summers, we bleach the walls, you know, uh, that that level of attention to detail. And, you know, I have this vivid memory of, wiping crumbs off a prep table in the pastry kitchen and some guy looks at me uh and is like are you a hack and i was like what what do you mean am i am i a hack and he was like well you just scraped that on the floor now someone else has to clean that up like do you think you're better than you know anyone in in kind of the the janit more janitorial services in the restaurant and i think going from school where like really giving a shit has no value and like isn't lauded to somewhere where like every little thing people had ultimate respect for was absolutely incredible. Uh, you know, being like a young, silly 14 year old boy and seeing, you know, some of the antics of the older chefs, you know, whether it was a good example or bad example, I think I was just like in absolute awe and excited by, uh, in retrospect, a lot of that stuff wasn't healthy or productive, uh, in any way, shape or form. But I do think, uh, yeah, I, th I think it was incredible to be around people with just such commitment to food and, and serving people, you know, fundamentally incredible uh, experiences through food. And, and you mentioned these, these folks that you worked with and, uh, uh, you, this doesn't have to be necessarily a celebrity chef that we all know, but who were some of your early sort of culinary inspirations? Was it was it a grandparent? Was it like how did you, how did you sort of get that that love? Was there anyone in in your orbit that that sort of you could point to as an inspiration? Uh, not really. Uh, I grew up. Uh, my parents can't cook. They still can't cook to this day. Um, <laughs> I always made the joke that they're philistines. Um, we didn't. <laughs> I grew up on takeout and chicken fingers and disgusting food. Uh, but we had like, I just had one meal at the, at the restaurant I ended up working at uh, for my sister's birthday, I think the year before. And it was just, you know, this out of body experience. And I was like, shit, people are doing this, you know, I'll do whatever I can to be a part of it. Um, but yeah, there was real no exposure in any way, shape or form. And I think that's why it felt so powerful. I think if my parents were good cooks and we had good food at home, I, I don't think I would have been as floored as kind of being in a uh, food desert isn't the right way, but like food, I grew up on food devoid of joy and getting to experience like food that really kind of viscerally impacts you emotionally um, was kind of that light bulb that went off that I was like, shit, this is exciting. Adam, I do want to, I'm sure we could talk more about your food journey, but I do want to talk about voyage foods. Um, so we're yeah. going to like jump in the timeline a little bit. I'm sure we can kind of fill in the blanks and kind of continue on with the conversation, but let's talk about voyage foods and maybe if we could start with, you know, what made you want to start that company? Yeah, I think they're, you know, I feel like doing something as silly as starting your own company. Uh, it's always a commutatorix, you know, problem of, of different inputs. But I think like a real huge piece of it was I was working in food tech. I was in the Bay Area, which, you know, 
if you go in 10 miles in any direction, there's like 20 plant-based meat companies, right? Mm -hmm. And looking around and it's just, you know, there are a million plant-based meat companies, a million plant-based milk companies, all the plant-based chicken nugget companies. And when you look at these things as like businesses, not just startups, like there seemed like there was just something missing, right? Uh, a lot of these even mature companies now have, you know, terrible margins and cost of goods and scalability problems, uh, aren't actually tackling some like the consumer needs. Uh, I could probably rant about this for hours and won't uh, subject either y'all or your viewers to this. But, you know, I, I think some of this stuff really isn't necessarily better for the environment. I think it's a lot of people who saw a lot of money in venture in food tech and just said, you know, OK, let's start some company companies. And I just thought, you know, there need to, needed to be like a pragmatic counterbalance in the industry to what was going on. And, you know, the reason we started with kind of the company and, and format where we started with of looking at these commodities that, you know, no one had up until that point looked at was really like, what are the need to haves, not the nice to haves, right? We'll like always be able to grow beef, right? We will always, you know, harvest cattle. We'll always be able to have chickens. You know, obviously today, given that there's avian flu, it's a separate issue, but like those aren't going away, right? And if you look at the simple stats on coffee of in 27 years, we're gonna have three X the demand and one third the supply, right? Chocolate doesn't look much better than that, right? And it's these pieces of accessibility of, you know, these things simply won't exist if people like us don't try to fix it, right? And for us, the experience of drinking a cup of coffee is the experience of drinking a cup of coffee. You know, there's so much process, et cetera, in between that green coffee bean and what we enjoy as a cup of coffee that there's no reason that has to come from, uh, you know, Arabica bean or something like that. And so that was really the impetus of, you know, how can we tackle these need to have problems in ways that are, you know, radically more sustainable, lower cost, highly scalable, clean label, um, and really available for everyone forever. Um, but in like, I think a lot of what we've built is really traced back to this idea of accessibility and accessibility both today and long term. I want you to try and stay with me on a metaphor that may not hold up, but we're going to do the experimentation right now. As you drink what I assume is an iced coffee from yeah. a, a vat of some kind, is that uh, the <laughs> folks that are watching this on YouTube can see that he just drank from a vat, I think. Oh, I didn't right? realize this was, yeah, yeah, <laughs> these are just what we store food in, in containers in the office. Um, <laughs> That's cool. Um, so so I'm going to try this metaphor. So it, Mike and I both operate uh, research centers, a research center in uh, the mining technology space, um, which seems leaps and bounds far away from food tech. But one thing uh, with the advent of electric vehicles, people are caring now more than ever about the ESG performance of the mineral companies oh, yeah. that, that they're working with. Um, can you talk like maybe the metaphor doesn't hold up perfectly, but is that I mean, obviously, the same thing has been happening in food for much longer. But can you talk about the state of sort of the ESG imperative in food and, and if you have any views on that? Yeah, I think there are a whole, like if we can bucket it there, I think a few very different important imperatives. There's there's the consumer side, right? The people are purchasing food at a grocery store. And I think, you know, unequivocally, we look at any industry. Now there's, you know, ESG focused fashion, bed sheets, uh, soaps, windows, e e everything, right? And, and so consumers do want that. I think it's proven with food that consumers want that, but they still vote with their uh, taste buds and dollar first. You know, ESG is never going to be first. Uh, then we look at the next bucket of, you know, we want to sell B2B ingredients. We, we want to provide, you know, Walmart's private label or, you know, uh, Nestle, uh, their coffee, so to speak. Right. And and all of those companies. Right. If we look at all the major CPGs, they all have very aggressive ESG goals. Um, and most of those ESG goals are. Like most of the, their ESG impacts are in these scope three metrics, right? And so it's their supply chain. It's not like, you're not going to get that far electrifying your facilities, you know, giving incentives for your employees to drive electric cars, electrifying your fleet, right? If 95% of your emissions are your scope three inputs, like 
that's where you can add the most value in, in, on the ESG side. So I think on the corporate side, there's a huge amount of focus on, you know, how can we clean up our supply chains? And then in the capital market space, obviously there's, there's been a huge amount of capital earmarked for food tech, agri-tech, et cetera. And I think that's because, you know, it's, it's just this next generation of, you know, how do we clean up the world? And I think people are starting to realize that, you know, food tech and agri-tech um, are ways to have, you know, wildly sizable impacts on, you know, total carbon emissions, deforestation, et cetera, globally. Um, but I think these different buckets have de very different reasons why to care, so to speak. And that's why it's kind of a, not necessarily convoluted, but complicated space. You know, Adam, when we're looking at the, the Voyage Foods website, one of the taglines is future-proofing your favorite food and drink. So one of the questions that Steve and I had when it comes down to the food science behind some of these new products that you're bringing to market, whether it's directly to consumers or B2B, is the goal to, to try to get as close as possible to those favorite foods or is it to put a spin on that to get as close as you can so that it still resonates with the consumer, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like an exact match. It's not going to replace what we have, but it's it's pretty darn close and you could feel good about it. Yeah, so the hope is that, uh, not the hope, but yeah, the, the whole the whole point, so to speak, is can these be facsimiles? And there's a difference between us being a facsimile of a Starbucks cold brew and us being a facsimile of a cold brew. And so we're at the point where if I sent you five cold brews today uh, and marked them with three letter codes, you know, humans can't statistically pull the one that's ours out of the set. Um, and so we are at that point. Uh, we, we're not at the point and, you know, of where we can recreate a specific chocolate perfectly, but we can re recreate the idea of chocolate perfectly now. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, part of that is, you know, to future-proof these things, right? We have to maintain the experience. And like, you know, I came to this not from a business perspective or a science perspective into this job, but really in a love of food perspective. And especially starting in pastry, uh, you're playing with chocolate a lot. And a lot of it was how do we, you know, preserve these human experiences. And I think if we had a different, different but equally good uh, offering on the consumption side, it, it really just wouldn't fulfill those same, same, same needs. And I, I wanted to jump in just to, because I was thinking about this earlier. Obviously, I think when we were talking about the ESG goals, and I think when it comes to sustainability and, you know, supply chain issues, especially, you know, uh, precarious supply chains, that that is obviously the driving force. But the thing that I think of as a, as a parent of young kids is, you know, nowadays there's a whole sorts of like, um, you know, allergies in the classroom. You can't bring certain things in the classroom. Oh, yeah. I don't remember dealing with that when I was a kid, but no. it's certainly something that we're dealing with now. And we've tried all different types of uh, different spreads for my daughter to, to bring into a classroom. And we do have, uh, you know, the, the peanut free nut butter from Voyage Foods. And she has a very discerning palate, but it's a winner. Uh, so, again, oh. you, you've won over the six year old in my house. That's great. Uh, who's 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 keen on that. Uh, so, again, it's great for us because we can pack, you know, her favorite kind of sandwich at lunch without, yeah. you know, putting anybody at risk. So I just wanted to kind of yeah. give you that as well. Awesome. Well, thanks for being a customer. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I should say that uh, your six-year-old was uh, gave it flying colors, and I also tried the uh, the chocolate. And this thirty-six-year-old also <laughs> likes it. So, um, but you're quite right. I mean, it, the fact it's it's a near near perfect facsimile of chocolate, but it's it's also its own uniqueness. Like you're not just trying yeah. to make a Cadbury chocolate bar. You're you're yeah. trying to 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 make your own uh, not spin because right? it's not a spin. It's it's yeah. it's your own product that has its own characteristics that someone could point to, like they would a Nestle or Cadbury someday and say that's a Voyage chocolate bar that that makes Absolutely. much more uh, much more of an impact, right? Absolutely. Um, I, I'm going to take this in a bit of a uh, of a different direction because I've listened to a lot of startup pitches to VCs in the past, and I should say that I've heard a lot from you know med tech to you know even mining technology. I've never really heard a ethically driven food company pitch to VC. What's that pitch like when you're, when you're, you know, like you'd like to think that investors care about a triple bottom line and things like that, but what's it like pitching an ethically driven food company to a, to a venture capital group? That's a great question. I don't know if I'm good at fundraising. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if, uh, you know, I, I've had a bunch of people kind of much earlier on the entrepreneurship journey, uh, you know, 
email me, so to speak, to, to you know, set up a 15 minute call to ask for fundraising advice in the space. And all I ever say is, if you have a good business and good business fundamentals, no matter how you phrase it, as long as you can kind of linearly tell the story, you're, you know, you'll be able to raise money, right? And if you don't have business fundamentals, that's the point where you really got to put lipstick on the pig, et cetera. But the story we I've really told from day one is, you know, these products are need to haves. You know, these are inevitabilities. The world is not just going to subtly reduce its coffee consumption by 90%, right? Um, these are inevitabilities. You know, also, if we look at like the growth of, you know, kerosene in the early 1900s when the whaling industry was dying, like these were inevitabilities, right? Um, <laughs> and and I think a, a lot of that story is, you know, we're we are not making, you know, molecular coffee, chocolate, and spread, right? We're, we're building the platform where we can, the R&D back end, so we can make any non-fibrous food product in ways that are, you know, lower cost today, more sustainable, clean label, you know, highly efficient from the process side and highly scalable and robust in such ways that, you know, have staying power in a changing climate. And I think when people have tasted the product and see our margins and cost of goods and our, our scale scalability, you know, I think that's really been the whole story. And I think I, I don't think lucky is the right word, but I feel very grateful that we kind of have the business fundamentals. So like, it's not really much of, you know, a fundraising pitch of like, these are the products. This is what the market looks like. This is what our cost of goods look like compared to what's already out there. This is what our margins are. This is objectively, you know, a good business and do you want to invest great if not there are probably other people who do um i know it's not super helpful but that that's kind of been our approach and you know our series a we didn't have decks or financial models by the time we got two term sheets uh so i think you know probably a little non-traditional on the on the fundraising side but i'm also wildly dyslexic uh and hate making things up and when you're a pre-revenue company making financial projections is impossible so um that's kind of how we ended up no it's that's that's refreshing here we actually hold an annual pitch competition every year through our department for students on campus who are looking to bring a business idea to life right and oftentimes they're very early stage where they're just looking for a little bit of capital to potentially register the business maybe work with some consultants and so the competition we have is very micro but again that's a question we get all the time is like what what's your what's your top three uh rules for pitching right and i think it's important i think the way that you grounded it that i think keeping you know the business fundamentals there and also knowing that your idea if it's a good idea and it's a sound business idea that, you know, this, that pitch may not go well with somebody, but there's going to be other people that might be interested in investing because the idea can hold up on its own. And if you're able to sell it, uh, you'll be able to find somebody. So that's great. Thanks. One of the things uh, we, we did want to ask, because we've been talking about these. And so obviously with the peanut free nut butter that's available now, and then you've got the cocoa free chocolate and the bean free coffee that's coming soon for B2B. Um, Maybe we could talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, those two la latter products that are coming to B2B, but also to kind of round it all out, like, is there anything that's coming next for Voyage Foods that you're able to talk about or able to tease for us? Because obviously you're, you're getting the, you know, the nut butter and the chocolate and the coffee kind of licked right now, but like, there's obviously all sorts of possibilities. So love to hear if there's anything you can share on, on that front. Uh, there's some things more on the, you know, cardio metabolic health side of food uh, that my patent lawyers would hang me if <laughs> I talked about because the IP is not filed yet. Um, that counts as a disclosure. Um, but yeah, there's some really exciting stuff in the pipeline, but uh, because of uh, patent issues and beautiful global IP laws, I can't talk about it at the moment. I mean, uh, the point I guess is that you're not, you're not sticking with three products. This is a, uh, no. This is a process that's implementable across a number of different uh, uh, food types, right? That that, uh, that we can expect to see. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's the that when you talk about the scalability of the business, that's it's perfecting that R and D process that can be applied to multiple different areas is where you're at, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's you know so much of the part of the value proposition, our current valuation, et cetera. Of you know, it's not just that we have brute forced these three things. It's that really we really have the core scientific back end to do this in a replicatable manner. And it's one of those things, right? If 
let's say commodity X, there's, you know, some bug that takes out bananas tomorrow, right? You know, we could turn on banana puree for industrial purposes very quickly if we probably needed to. Um, and, you know, I think given that, you know, the world is changing and the acceleration of change, especially climate wise, is going to continue, I think it, it puts us in a really good place and, you know, de-risks us from some industry trends, et cetera. Yeah, I, before we uh, before we let you go, Adam, I'm going to take a chance and then I'm going to escape and retreat from it if it doesn't turn out the way I, I want it to. Sounds but you, good. But you don't happen to be a Star Trek fan at all? Uh, no. Okay. Well, then I'll retreat. All I was going to say is, and this is uh, me falling on my face with a chance, <laughs> in law they tell you don't ask a question you don't know the answer to, but um, I'll just break that right now. Uh, in Star Trek, of course, they use things called replicators, which take yeah. the uh, the sort of constituent parts of our favorite foods and can replicate them. It seems like you're taking the first step with your company in, in, a, in a future where we can have all of our favorite foods kind of forever, just like on Star Trek. Is that the hope? Yeah, in some ways that is. Um, <laughs> I think like it's one of those things of, you know, a hundred years ago, we couldn't imagine the innovations we're doing today. But sitting in the seat I'm sitting in right now, I can't imagine the possibility of that existing in a device. But, you know, I, I think it's one of those things like that's why science is so exciting. That's why technology is so exciting, because this stuff you never imagined was possible, maybe possible. But but I think, you know, that kind of note by note approach to production is something that's wildly interesting. Right. Um, and and super exciting. And, you know, hope. It, it, it flatters me. I've heard the re replicator analogy a million times, and and it, uh, it flatters flatters me that 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 you reference us in this in the same sentence. So thank you. Well, that that's good. I mean, if, if nothing else, if I wasn't married, I would have secured my virginity for another ten years by talking about Star Trek on a podcast. <laughs> so, so, uh, but anyway, you, you was, stuck the landing, Steve. Yeah, 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 stuck the landing. <laughs> yeah, good. I took a chance. Uh, Adam Maxwell. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you. We, had a, we had a great time. Thanks for spending uh, the better part of a half an hour with us. And everyone can check out uh, where Voyage Foods is going. We'll, uh, we'll link to your, uh, your website and in the show notes. Thanks so much uh, for joining cool. us today. Thank you. Have Thanks, a great Adam. Day, all. Yeah, you too. Appreciate Bye. it. You stuck the landing, Steve. Yeah. You know, you took a it chance was shaky. there. It was shaky. <laughs> but, I, but I think, you know, just despite the fact that, you know, he was not, uh, you know, a Star Trek fan himself and clearly not as, as much of a Star Trek fan as you that the reference he had heard before. So obviously I think a lot of people have brought up the replicator uh, analogy to him and, and, and how we can use that to future proof our food. So obviously Adam was not going to divulge to us on a podcast about where mm -hmm. they're going, but we can talk about where, where we would go if we were future proofing yeah. our favorite foods. So I'm going to put you on the spot. And again, knowing that you're still hungry and, it's probably gonna be whatever pops in your head, but if you were to have, if you had a replicator and you could future proof your favorite food so that in 30 years from now, you had that on demand and you were not subject to, you know, sustainability issues and supply chain issues, what would be that number one setting in your replicator that would deliver you your, uh, your favorite future proofed food? Well, and of course I'll ask the same of you in a second, but I, I the, uh, so I, I'll start like, peanut butter for sure mm -hmm. would would be one that uh and which is why voyage foods uh resonates so much with me but but i think um like much to the um much to the contrary to the healthy lifestyle i should be living i would really love <laughs> like I, I love all cheeses like i'm a huge like cheese guy i love all kinds of cheeses and what a replicator could give you was exactly that dialed in recipe of a camembert or a brie or an asiago right so you could get any kind of cheese and i would never want that to leave the planet so i think that i would probably select cheese as a wide category what you about know, you uh, you did all the heavy lifting for me because that was actually the one that i had in my head because i think about like what our family eats mm -hmm. and obviously i think you know the given that cheese is probably somehow in almost every meal and it's definitely like a go-to snack that if there was a day and time in the, in the not too distant future where it was no longer available to us under its current, you know, form, uh, that would probably be a devastating blow to the Camuto household and for for a lot of Italian families. So I would I would go with that. I mean, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, even the 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 cho chocolate is a big one for me. 
So, I mean, yeah. I'm again, I'm on board with what Adam's trying to do there with the, with the cocoa free chocolate. I haven't had the chance to try their version. They had sent us some stuff before the podcast, but I'm trying to observe uh, what I'm referring to as a dessert free January. And so they, I have them sitting in my fridge. I will try them at the end of the month, but uh, I've been a good boy so far and I'm not going to break my, uh, my fast, so to speak. We're not going to get into it now, but you know how I feel about these elimination <laughs> diets after the uh, after the new year. But uh, we'll save that for another podcast. The good cool. news is we have another food podcast under our belts. We yeah. can almost have a catalog of of food podcasts. Uh, so uh, Canada's smartest kitchen comes to mind. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you this to close it out because uh, obviously I think when we're talking about Voyage Foods, say the first thing that's going to come to mind for a lot of people because this product is in is in retail is obviously the peanut free nut butter. But you mentioned you're a big peanut butter guy. I am myself. Are you, let me ask you this. Maybe this is me revealing a you know, oh, wow. a part of myself I think... that I, I didn't want to share on the podcast, but like, are you the like spoon into the jar of peanut butter? Like that's how we're getting it in. Or are you only spreading it on, you know, toast, bread, crackers, or you, do you get down like that? So the delivery method is, is flexible for me. I will go in with a a tablespoon and and get yeah. a yunk of that guy, but I'm not putting it back in. It's a single use spoon for me. So you've got all these little tasting spoons, like a chef in your kitchen, so you can just keep. Well, how much peanut butter can a person eat? Like I do a hefty tea, like tablespoon. Yeah. And then I'll I'll eat that, and and that's it. I'm not if I if I would go back, I'd get a fresh spoon. Unfortunately, that's that's fair. I mean, that's I think that's courteous to the people you have over at your house. So let me tell you this, because I know that you, as, as the contrarian that you are, you've never watched Ted Lasso, mm-hmm. um, but never will, never will obviously. Cause then you, you wouldn't be a contrarian if you watched it, but in Ted Lasso, he talks about how, and I, I'll probably screw this up. So people can yell at me later, but well, you uh, should go for it anyway. I, I mean, you took a chance. I'm going to take a chance. He he's a Ted Lasso. The character in the show is an admitted uh, loves peanut butter. And what he does though is he'll just take the lid off the jar, put the jar on like on the kitchen counter or kitchen island, so that whenever he walks by, he can stick his finger in and no. grab. And and to me, like I thought, you know what? If you're if you're single and you know when he, no, he is in the no. show, spoiler alert. But uh, and you're the only one eating from that jar fine but that's still kind of gross to me we're maniac like, get a spoon. you gotta be a maniac get a knife get a spoon we're, we're still not animals get a tongue depressor anything like, what, but what, what, your, he, your raw finger into a jar he might as well be winnie the pooh with a honey pot like what's he doing <laughs> yeah no i i i mean there's i've been single i'm not gonna lie to you <laughs> there's been times when i've uh when i've wanted some peanut butter while i'm alone and i always use a spoon because I'm not an animal. It's yeah, no, it's pretty gross. So I've turned the show off even further for you. So there you go. But uh, yeah. but again, that would be the Ted Lasso test. Is Ted Lasso taking Voyage uh, Foods uh, peanut free nut butter for a spin with his fingers in the kitchen? I'm going to say yes. So <laughs> there you have it. It's been another episode of the Unlikely Innovators. Thanks for tuning in this week and uh, hearing our conversation with Adam Maxwell. We'll be back next week with some more uh, content for you. Bye. The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining.